everyone and thank you very much to Eleanor and to all of the organisers for the opportunity to participate today. Um, our theme uh, for today is uh, Introduction to Intersectionality, uh, the key thematic focus of this year's summer school. And our panel this morning is going to answer the question, um, what is intersectionality anyway? So opening up this whole question of what do we mean when we talk about intersectionality? So we have two speakers, um, both will present and then we'll open it up to you uh, for Q&A and discussion. Our first speaker this morning is Professor Mary Romano, Mer Romero. Uh, Mary is Professor of Justice Studies and Social Inquiry at Arizona State University. She's the President-elect of the American Sociological Association and is the author of numerous books on domestic work and specifically also is the author of Introducing Intersectionality, published with Polity Press. Her most recent co-edited book is When Care Work Goes Global, Locating the Social Relations of Domestic Work, published with Ashgate. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Intersectionality's focus on social inequality has its roots and development in social justice research and struggle. As an activist project, intersectionality provides analytical tools for framing social justice issues in such a way as to expose how social exclusion or privilege or privilege occurs differently in various social positions, and it does this by focusing on the interaction of multiple systems of oppression. Let me begin by addressing what intersectionality is not. Critical race feminist scholars have cautioned against the dangers of interpreting intersectionality as diversity. Over the last decades, many sites in society have called for multiculturalism and diversity. While the celebration and application of diversity popularized in the 1980s and found in corporate initiatives and school curricula did attempt to provide a space for different voices, this multiculturalism was not aimed at eliminating social inequality. Calls for representational inclusion with the goal of commercial value or the incorporation of people of color in the media through hegemonic frameworks perpetuate stereotypes and racial tropes. Here, people are simply an array of races, cultures, and various able bodies standing apart from the power relations that are the important meaning attached to these differences. Institutional diversity, practices, and language uncover the manufacturing of cohesion or multiversity diversity, which does not address inequality. Celebrating differences for the sake of inclusion does not dismantle everyday practices of privilege or oppression. Intersectionality is not concerned with diversity or multiculturalism, but with power relationships, specifically the ways that difference embeds domination and oppression. White, male, heterosexual, citizenship, and able-bodied privileges are not personal but are institutional arrangements that provide persons classified as white, male, heterosexual, or able-bodied greater access to power and resources. Intersectional scholarship can be traced to the early inquiries and concern over social inequalities arising from social activism. As, activism, as activists, attempted to explain the different material conditions or economic circumstances within specific groups, fellow activists felt marginalized because their experience were not included. These marginalized activists challenged others to capture their circumstances, which led to intersectional theorizing about inequalities. Conceptualizing class, caste, and status are among the top endeavors of these scholar activists. 
social hierarchies are not one-dimensional, and power relations in families, communities, and nations cannot ex be explained without examining how and why certain social identities are subordinated to others and interact with each other in different ways. I will briefly trace the conceptualization of intersectionality as emerging from an activist tradition, a tradition linked to a lived experience of activism that aimed to generate solutions serving to eliminate oppression. I will first consider how the term intersectionality came about. Most frequently, legal scholar Kimberly Grinshaw is credited for coin coining the term intersectionality in her 1989 article, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics, which is widely cited legal writings on intersectionality and emerged from the inability to capture the experiences of black women in anti-discrimination law. When going to court as plaintiffs in discrimination cases, black women were unable to prove gender discrimination because not all women experienced uh, were discriminated against, and they were unable to prove race discrimination because not all black people were discriminated against. Courts failed to recognize black women's accounts about experiencing race and sex discrimination simultaneously. Instead, their injuries were marginalized by forcing them to either claim gender or race discrimination and refusing to recognize how sexism and racism operated simultaneously. Grinshaw's term gained popularity for starting to entangle how racism and patriarchy interests interact. The interaction has often gone unnoticed in contemporary feminist and anti-racist discourses. The sociological roots of intersectionality are firmly planted in the mid-1800s and early 1900s in the struggle for women and African American rights in the United States. Several prominent black women stand out in referencing multi-identities in the fight for women's rights and for civil rights for African Americans. Most noted were Mar Marie Stewart, Sojourner Truth, Anna Julia Cooper, and Mary Church Trudell. Maria Stewart was one of the first African American women to lecture on the unique position of black women facing racism and sexism. Born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1803, she became a domestic servant when her parents died, and after leaving the service, she obtained an education. Stewart called on black women to develop their highest intellectual capacities to enter all spheres of life of the mind and to participate in all activities within the community. As a writer and activist, she also considered black women's cl class oppression and advocated for establishing cooperative economics to gain economic independence. Unlike Stewart, Sojourner Truth was born a slave and after 26 years she managed to escape with her daughter, leaving three children behind. She eventually won a court case and won the freedom of her son. A few years older than Stewart, Sojourner Truth is better known for her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman, that highlighted the invisibility of black women in the discussion of women's oppression. In 1858, Anna Julia Cooper, born enslaved, became one of the first African American women to earn a doctoral degree in the United States. Cooper taught and eventually became a school principal in Washington, D.C. She founded the Colored Women's League of Washington and was a strong leader for racial justice and women's rights. Mary Church Trudell, known for her activism for civil rights and suffrage, was born in 1863 to former slaves. She was a founding member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, and the founder of the National Association of College Women, now known as the National Association of University Women. The writings of these four black women activists and intellectuals are significant in that they show how the roots of intersectionality lie embedded in their lived experiences of marginalized groups' struggle for social justice. As Maria Stewart, Sojourner Truth, 
Anna Julia Cooper and Mary Church Triel fought to end racism, economic inequalities, and the abuses of women's rights. They became visible. The, they, they made visible the inadequacy of platforms set forth by white women suffragists or civil rights leaders. Early black feminists engaged in activism to gain the rights for women and for all African Americans, their work capturing the intersection of race and gender. While the theoretical foundation of intersectionality is clearly loaded, located in the 18th century black feminist writings, many scholars also acknowledge W.B. Du Bois' inclusion of interconnecting systems of oppression, namely race, class, and nation in his writings. In addressing social problems plaguing the black community, Du Bois examined racist ideologies and the practices and structures of capitalism. He recognized and investigated the power that the United States imposed on its colonies through international policy, invasion, and colonialism. Du Bois conceptualized class, race, and nation as interlocking systems which reinforce each other to oppress African Americans. Structures are socially created and extremely persistent. Like early feminists that also wrote and spoke during the same time, W.B. Du Bois' research and writing was deeply embedded in the scholar-activist tradition. The next significant period in the development of an intersectionality arose with the activism and writing of black feminists in the 1970s and expanded over the next three decades. The social movements in the 70s organized around specific issues of racial or gender inequality, thus familiar issues arose as women of color found themselves found their realities erased. For example, Frances Bill, the co-founder of the Black Women's Liberation Committee of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, wrote one of the defining documents of black feminism, double jeopardy to be black and female. Bell argued that racism and capitalism produced and maintained problems in the black family and the community. In her analysis of economic exploitation, she never loses sight of the intersection of race, class, and gender. She connected the capitalist exclusion of black men from the labor force with hiring black women at low wages in reproductive jobs with poor working conditions, such as domestics, nannies, and practical nurses. The functional consequence created circumstances denying blacks the resources to achieve manhood and womanhood as defined under US capitalism, that is, working breadwinner men and homemaking caregiving women. Nevertheless, African American internalized these mainstream gendered ideologies, causing tensions and frustrations between black men and women. Bill challenged black men to gain racial inequality and liberation, but without male privilege that subordinated black women. She advocated productive lives for black women and the development of academic and technical skills and talents for both men and women. Bill chastised white feminists for treating the women's movement as monolithic. Her writings and speeches further elaborate why feminists must adopt an anti-imperialism and anti-racist ideologies to understand their plight, but also their privilege as white women. Bill is one of the many noted black feminist activists participating in the civil rights and feminist movements to confront social justice issues concerning black women, third world, and working women, working people. Another noted contribution during the late 70s with the Comanche River Collective. The collective is significant for including sexual orientation in black feminism. As a black feminist lesbian organization in Boston, they were active in social justice campaigns, including the desegregation of Boston schools, protests against police brutality in the black communities, and violence against women. Their activism as feminists and lesbians did not advocate for separatism, but was committed to inclusive coalition building with progressive black men. After numerous retreats aimed to articulate the tenets of black feminism, in 1977, they issued their collective statement, Black Feminists Organizing in the 70s and 80s. 
Their statement has been depicted as one of the strongest, earliest, and most often reprinted manifestos of feminist identity politics in the United States, as well as a bedrock foundation of black feminist theory. The collective statement presented a multidimensional analysis of race, class, gender, and sexuality with several important characteristics. Simultaneous oppressions, multi-interlocking structures, the interaction of ranking functions, and acknowledging that these oppressions are created and maintained by capitalism, imperialism, and patriarchy. Black feminist coalitions made common cause with other groups of women of color to generate further critiques of mainstream feminist practice. The intellectual critiques helped further articulate their activist goals of inclusion while developing an analysis of multi-dimensions of inequality. An important feminist anthology arising out of this coalition is this bridge called My Back, writings by radical women of color edit, uh, edited by Cherie Moraga and Gloria Ansaldua. Many contribute the chapters to providing intellectual foundations for third wave feminism, which linked feminism, race, class, and sexuality. Another example of growing popularity of intersectional critiques of white feminists appeared in Angela Davis's book, Women, Race, and Class. She recounted the history of black and white women's fight for social inequality and highlighted white feminists' failure to uphold a political agenda inclusive of women of color. Another black feminist who pushed thinking beyond one-dimensional frameworks of difference is Audre Lorde. In her essay, Age, Race, Class, and Sex, Women Defining Difference, Lord called attention to the European tendency to postulate simple dichotomies such as dominant, subordinate, good, bad, up, down, superior, inferior, which in the process function to establish a mythical norm. The mythical norm defines human differences outside the norm as deviant. Lord challenged white women to see black women as women and different from themselves, and to recognize the range of women's issues these differences present. Again, situated in activism for social equality and justice, Lord argued that we must recognize differences among women who are our equals, neither inferior nor superior, and devise ways to use each other's differences to enrich our visions and joint struggles. Lord, like Davis and Beale, were instrumental in bringing together the idea that all forms of oppression differ and are significant in understanding social inequality. In review, privilege does not disappear by ignoring its existence, and ignorance will not result in social, inequ social equality. Too often, educators and reformers view diversity as an opportunity to interact with persons of different racial, ethnic, class, gender, and sexual identities to experience that we are all the same, and thus argue that these interactions promote social harmony. In contrast, the aim of intersectional analysis is to understand how privilege and domination function in creating and maintaining differences and to begin to create systems of equality. Intersectionality is interested in exposing the unearned privileges certain groups receive by simply being socially assigned or identified as white, male, heterosexual, a citizen, or able-bodied. Another aim is to begin to examine the institutionalization of privilege and to analyze how it exists as invisible, common sense, natural, or even as earned privilege when it is not. Most importantly, intersectionality is a challenge to one-dimensional approaches to race, class, gender, sexuality, and citizenship, and instead requires us to acknowledge the systems of oppression standpoint or position taking contextualizes social identities and structures that space of possibilities of lived experience of race, gender, and class privilege and oppression. Only by recognizing that mono-dimensional mono approaches to schools, family, media, and the law, and other social institutions preserve the practice that maintains social inequality can we begin to identify and resist the privilege embedded in everyday interaction. 
All these categories of privilege are socially constructed and can be explained through the history of oppression and resistance. Capturing the nuances of intersectionality demands rethinking how we approach social issues and conceptualize social inequality. Many scholars from marginalized communities took lessons from participation in social movements organizing against social inequality. These experiences in coalition building offer new ways to define social issues from a range of social positions posing inclusive solutions. Legal scholar Maria Masuta offered an example of such a process, and I quote, the way I try to understand the interconnection of all forms of subordination is through a method I call ask the other question. When I see something that looks racist, I ask, where is the patriarchy in this? When I see something that looks sexist, I ask, where is the racism in this? When I see something that looks homophobic, I ask, where are the class interests in this? Working in coalition forces us to look at both the obvious and the non-obvious relationships of domination, helping us to realize that no form of subordination ever stands alone. Marsuda depicts a strategy that involves approaching a social issue from multiple perspectives. Defining an issue from an intersectional approach is tricky since problems arise among certain groups more quickly or affect them in ways that are more visible. Traditional problems intersecting race and class have focused solely on race or solely on class rather than understanding the lived experience of both factors. However, another way of approaching social issues is offered by Lonnie Gunier and Gerald Torres, who argued that recognizing, and quote, experience which converge around a racial minority are often a diagnostic tool. Starting with the experiences of people of color, we can begin to identify the crucial missing element of American democracy, missing elements that make the systems fail, not just for blacks or Latinos, but for many other groups that are similarly situated." End of quote. Using the metaphor of the canary in the mines, they call for a political race project. The canary serves both as a diagnostic and an innovative function. What the canary lets us see are the hierarchical arrangements of power and privilege that have naturalized this unequal distribution. Therefore, Gunier and Torres propose that we consider the experience of the most vulnerable population very seriously because they are the first to exhibit problems arising from structural problems. Turning, the issue, uh, turning to the issue of mass incarceration and school to prison pipeline, there is a high cost in working class and poor communities of color dealing with over-policing and surveillance, interactions with militarized police force, and the incarceration of the mentally ill, drug offenders, and persons of nonviolent crime, and the list goes on. But white middle class communities are also impacted. They too share part of the burden of losing civil liberties, shifting budgets away from social benefits and improving schools, increasing the cost of state colleges and universities, and eroding infrastructure of highway and bridges. Gunier and Torres suggest that inclusive solutions are found when an approach is explicitly intersectional. This approach identifies marginalized groups that are most vulnerable to the issue at hand, examines their experiences, and considers them as the canaries in the mine, rather than attempting to identify only one or two causal characteristic. As Gunier and Torres reminds us, all canaries bear watching. Our, democ our democratic future depends on it. Thinking about the social world as an intersectionality invites students, researchers, and activists to examine the dynamics of power relations, both privileges and oppression. Intersectionality helps us understand troubling conditions and circumstances as social issues rather than simply as personal problems requiring individuals to change their behavior. For instance, society treats care work as a personal problem that is a burden of family members. Yet all of us face a time in our life that we are dependent on others to care for us. At birth and during childhood, individuals need care. When we are sick, disabled, or become physically limited by age, people experience dependency. Even when dependency and the need for caregiving 
is a need that we share. There are no comprehensive government programs or policies to assist all parents and individuals requiring care. An intersectional approach to the care issue not only considers those in the need of care, but also those providing care. In summary, it is important to recognize that unlike most conceptual frameworks in academic work, intersectionality has its roots and evolution in collective struggles. Consequently, studying multiple dimensions of inequality is only one aim of this intellectual project. To grasp the ongoing evolution of this powerful tool, we must recognize that identifying and understanding inequality must occur alongside the struggle to resist and actively challenge all forms of oppression. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And uh, I think that was a, a really challenging presentation that um, raises questions as to the institutionalization of privilege, uh, thinking about coalition building, uh, how intersectionality is rooted in collective struggles, and the importance of thinking about the multiple interse intersecting axes of uh, discrimination uh, inequality and institutionalization of power and privilege. Um, we will have time for questions and discussion. I'm sure that has raised many uh, questions for you. Um, but we're going to move on now to our next speaker, uh, Eleanor Lisney. And Eleanor is a campaigner, a founder member, public speaker and coordinator of Sisters of Frida. Uh, which is a collective of women with disabilities. She's an access advisor, an aspiring creative practitioner, and co-founder of Culture Access CIC, which is about supporting access and bringing an inclusive edge to intersectionality. She was born in Malaysia, uh, has lived in Strasbourg, France, and studied in Austin, Texas. Uh, she has written and writes for Media Diversified, and is passionate about embedding intersectionality in all aspects of her work. Eleanor. Um, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I prefer to be out here than behind a podium. Um, as said, I am an activist not an academic, so um, my talks will be very different. Uh, I gave a presentation in the University of Warwick uh, last week, and I even dispensed with the PowerPoint. But I thought in this case, I was asked for uh, something that can be printed. So yeah, here, here's the PowerPoint. Um, I am very grateful for the, um, law, um, the, the explanation about what ex intersectionality is about. I didn't think that in this uh, school I would need to because I can see that there are so many academics that will be here to explain it to you. So, Let me start by explaining a little bit about Sisters of Frida, which is a CIC which stands for a community interest company. I'm not going to go into that. But the important thing about this is Sisters of Frida is an experimental collective of disabled women. We want a new way of sharing experiences, its support and relationships with different networks. And we say disabled people, disabled women in the UK because of something called the social model of disability, which I'm not really covering um, this morning. But if anybody wants to ask me about that, feel free. So together we are building different networks of disabled women. So we look at the barriers and the multiple discrimination that have not changed. So we struggle to hear our, have our voices heard as disabled women in our own rights. 
the concept of intersectionality, as you have heard earlier, brilliantly uh, explained. Um, this is a sort of short um, summary. It's a concept often used in critical theories to describe the ways oppressive institutions, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, this or ableism, xenophobia, classism, etc., are interconnected and cannot be examined separately from one another. And this concept is attributed to Kimberly Crenshaw. I'm also indebted to my ideas about intersectionality and I use the phrase disability justice because I had the good opportunity, good chance of meeting um, Lydia X. Z. Brown um, from the United States. I actually persuaded, or they didn't need much persuasion, the, the WOW Festival in London, WOW stands for Women of the World, festival at the South Bank, which is one of the biggest women's festivals in England, to invite her to come and give a talk, or several talks. And one of the talks she gave was Introduction to Intersectionality. And she talked about the intersections of layers of privilege and oppression. And importantly, note about disability, just, uh, disability rights, but disability justice. Um, she says, I beg your pardon, they said, uh, disability justice is the art and practice of honouring the body, mind, all body, minds. They were incredible, and I would recommend you to look it up, their entire speech on the WOW website. Because they gave a whole new slant to depth, I would say, to the idea, the concept of intersectionality. Okay, Sister Sufrida, the idea started when, if you see in the picture, this is Michelle Daly and myself, and for those who, have, who can't see, the image description is, there are two women wheelchair users, one black, one East Asian, each holding a document and one has a microphone. We were asked to speak at the Million Women Rise. This is a procession of women against domestic violence that is held every year in London, and it ends in Trafalgar Square. And we were asked to talk about disabled women and domestic violence. After that, we, Michelle and myself, um, we were two disabled women of colour speaking about domestic violence and disabled women at Trafalgar Square, and this was in 2010. We realised soon that neither disabled women, uh, disabled people's organisations, nor women's organisations engage with disabled women's issues. That set us thinking. Now, the concept of intersectionality at that time was not known. We were probably the first disabled group in the UK to use the term. We were told by others that it would not be understood, that we were using jargon. We were even told that this was divisive because there is no gender in disability. Should it matter? Should we point out that there are differences between disabled men 
and women. And that there is, you know, there are specific issues that disabled women face. So, I'm going to start with talk about intersecting disability and gender. And I'm not going too much about it because I know uh, Stephanie Otoleba is going to be delivering um, a presentation tomorrow on that. Um, just to give you something that I can find, because it's very difficult to find disaggregated data on just disabled women or find dis disaggregated data on disabled, pe disabled people into race, uh, sexual orientation, women, etc. But the TUC in, the, in, in England, the Trade Union Congress, this is their statistics from a report last month. And gender, gap, gender pay gap, because this, this is a union, so they do talk about employment. Disabled women face a larger pay gap than disabled men. Compared to non-disabled men, the pay gap is 13% for disabled men and 22% for disabled women. My maths isn't very good, but I can tell you. It's almost twice, right? And this is from um, 2008, I think. So it's not changed that much. I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but you can see that you know, disabled women is right at the bottom and it's at the lowest. <laughs> so you can see the range of the predicted pay. Now, now talk about intersections more than just gender. So you have intersecting disability, gender, race, faith, and nationality. As I've said, there are no disaggregating data that I know of that does disability and race. But in the UK, I'm speaking specifically of the UK because this is where I'm from, if you look at something we call the hostile environment, hostile environment as referring to this sort of austerity drive, and at the moment, what is happening with Brexit, and also what is happening to people who are not citizens from other nationality, refugees, etc. Even people from the EU countries have been told that they need to go home. And <laughs> there is an enormous problem about that. And recently, if you follow UK news, there's this huge scandal that's called the Windrush scandal, which is a lot of people from the Caribbean who'd come over <coughs> to work in the 1970s who were, di who were actually UK citizens, were suddenly said that they needed to have proof that they're UK citizens. And a lot of documents were lost. And they have been in incredible hardships to a lot of uh, people in that generation. So, you want to say that you have to acknowledge the different journeys of disabled people of colour. That we, people of colour, are impacted by what happens to our communities and our young people. In my local community forum, there's this thing called the stop and search police procedure, which means that the police can stop and search anybody they want. I asked about disabled people of colour who get discriminated even more because of their colour. Who advocates for them? When you get doubly discriminated, who do you go for help? What about disabled women of colour when it comes to violence against women? refugees or in a hospital environment when they have accessibility needs as well as di dietary and other faith needs. 
intersecting disability, gender, race, faith, nationality. So this is a continuation to the other side. Um, one example I'm giving from the news uh, quite recently in April. Um, we have this new thing called universal credit that's been rolled out in England that's caused an incredible hardship to a lot of disabled people. Um, and I'm not going to do that. You can Google it if you, <laughs> if you want to. Um, but frontline domestic abuse workers were spending increasing amount of time trying to sort out universal credit problems for victims of domestic violence at the expense of wider direct support that they could offer. Delays and bureaucracy experienced by universal credit claimants have driven some domestic abuse victims back to their abuser. And in one case, an abuse victim had lost a place in a refuge because it was impossible to get officials to rule whether the woman, an European economic area national, qualified for universal credit costs. And this is just a snapshot of the sort of things that are happening. And this is an EU, EU citizen. <laughs> And then there are the intersecting disability and the other. And this is a quote from a disabled trans bisexual man. He said, I haven't always felt embraced by the trans community as someone who has a disability. I have heard ableist comments made within the LGBTQI community and I've had encountered ableism within the LGBTQI safe spaces numerous times. I often see people who are supposed to be allies making offensive ableist com com comments on social media during <coughs> arguments. And it is ableism. Um, and it is co offensive. And this is Ryan, a young disabled bisexual trans person. And the, it's, from, um, it's from a newspaper. The link is there. So, intersectionality. So you have this or ableism and discrimination of all levels. So the way I look at it, intersectionality, it's not just intersecting. Sometimes I think of it as a sort of threads that are weaved together. It's very difficult to take apart. Another way I like to put it is that if you have multiple identities. You are eating at many tables because of the many identities, but you are never really invited to sit at any of them because you're always the other, not truly accepted or accommodated. So how do you, we talked about the concepts so what is the practice? How do you put what you know about intersectionality into practice? <clears throat> Say, start from where you are. Do you recognize your own privileges? Do you think beyond your own rights? Are you inclusive? Do you look to see who is not in the room, if they should be given a voice? And does it make a difference? If I may, I would like to bring a video of um, two weeks ago. One of the people who took part in one of our projects. She was asked to speak at City Hall in London and the deputy mayor was there. 
to talk about the importance of safe spaces for women, the importance of speci specialism. And this is in, in the videos, you can hear what she says. I'm sorry, the quality is not very good, um, but I just want you to take note that she, what she said is, you, if you see disabled women of color, and that could be people of color as well, but in this particular case, it was a woman's space, mm -hmm. not just as participants, but as leaders. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me and thank you for the invitation. Um, that piece was written to capture some of my experiences in uh, women-only spaces. Um, but this afternoon I'm going to focus on Sisters of Frida, which I am a sister of. Um, Sisters of Frida is a disabled women's collective, um, experimental, um, so we're not a uh, service as such. Um, but we do gather and we do meet and um, we support each other fundamentally. Um, I had a breakdown five years ago. I had um, a mental breakdown. I've been bullied most of my life, particularly in the workplace, um, and I just couldn't continue, couldn't carry on, really. Um, and I had hidden disabilities for a very long time, um, but it took a lot to kind of accept that within myself, really. And also as well, particularly coming from the cultural background that I come from, it's disability is still very stigmatized and kind of pushed back. Um, so it was very difficult to even accept that as a part of my identity. So from the ashes, I had to work out who was I, who am I now, um, post breakdown, post kind of disability, you know, and all of those things. I found largely in a woman only space it being very cathartic and very healing. Um, I came across Sisters of Frida just by a Google search, really. I was looking for my tribe, as it were, and I found two um, women only uh, spaces, one of which is Sisters of Frida, and I turned up to their AGM in 2016. And um, I was kind of asked, what, what are you doing here? Because at that point, you know, I wasn't using a walking aid. I, I was walking with an umbrella for years. My GPs looked at me like, you know. But it is kind of the self, ex not accepting and kind of stigma of using a walking aid. You know, it's all kind of mad looking back at it now. But, um, but yeah. Um, and what I saw was disabled women not without shame, but with pride, getting on with their day-to-day -day life. Um, I didn't see stigma, I didn't see embarrassment, I didn't see none of that. I just saw women who happened to be disabled. It was very free, it was very um, liberating, and, and I tell you, I, if it wasn't for those kind of encounters, I wouldn't be here today, and I wouldn't be standing here in front of you, a proud black disabled woman. In those spaces, it's about mutual support, it's about respect, it's about sharing experiences. I have learned to be a disabled woman by another disabled woman. I was asked um, at the meeting, uh, when did you self-identify? Because when you do self-identify, it's like a, a, a coming out. And I didn't really agree with that, because it, it felt like that. It felt that I could really say it and say it with pride, that disability was a part of my identity. Now, you might not think that walking with an umbrella and kind of um, hiding and hiding away, uh, and, and from that to being the person I am now is not a big deal. And you can't quantify that, and often services are looking for quantifiable data, they're looking for those things. Um, but it, it, you know, it needs to move further than that. It's about the soft stuff, it's about self-esteem, it's about being in a space where women can grow and feel accepted and then replicate that in other arenas in their life. 
It's about leveraging on the top and the shoulders of women who's been there, done that. And you can grow and share those experiences together. It's also important for me that all aspects of my identity is taken into account. Often in other spaces that I've uh, been to, uh, other women kind of silence me, don't want my voice heard, and it's very important that black women, women of colour, are heard. And not in a tokenistic way, but in a way that is um, really included. What I saw as Sisters of Frida were women of colour, front and centre, of the organisation, at the seat of the decision-making table, driving the organisation forward. Black women, women of colour, were not just beneficiaries of the service, but they had parity of the scene. Now, in terms of this climate of austerity, and when we look at the Running Me and the Women's Budget Group uh, report that was written in October 2017, Intersecting Inequalities. And it talks about the stark uh, disadvantages that black and Asian women are facing in uh, services and also in society in terms of social care reforms and all the rest of it. It's very important that when those women come into women only spaces, that those other factors are taken into consideration when offering any kind of support and services. A holistic approach wherever we can. Within a cultural framed uh, lens as well. So why women? Truly, if it wasn't for women's sisters of freedom and other women only spaces, I wouldn't be here. And it, it has really helped me to build a life for myself, a congruent identity, and a future supported by my sisters. Thank you very much. of somebody is much better than you hearing me go on and on and on. And this is just, you know, it says, does intersectionality matter? I would say, yes, it does. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. And this is my, uh, if you wish to keep in contact or ask any questions. Thank you.